if we can teach the ideals of justice, of equality, of being egalitarian, that's why we started the movement. That's what it was all about. Because again, I'm but a foot soldier in this representing anyone who has contributed to moving us forward for the good of our patients in the community, not for the good of one individual. So I was born in South Texas. It was a very different time in South Texas in those days, the late 40s, the early 50s. Um, we were all classified as Mexicans and uh, we weren't treated very well and that was just a part of life. Discrimination was not only legal and accepted uh, socially, but it was a norm. My mother died when I was 16. We lived in Yuma, Arizona. I had just gotten there. I didn't quite understand that. That was hard, just because she was young and strong. She was 37. I was very fortunate because I left Yuma, Arizona when I finished high school in 1967 and went to San Francisco. I was touched, I always say. I was fortunate to have been a part of that, uh, lucky to have lived through it and would never want to do it again. Um, but it was an important time. If you think about 67, it wasn't not just a musical revolution in this country, but the civil rights movement was really in full gear. The anti-war movement was just starting to take off into full gear. The women's rights movement was gaining tremendous traction, and all of that was being spearheaded in California. So I took off for a year and uh, went hitchhiking around the country. I left North Carolina hitchhiking in the summer of 1970 and um, had on my itinerary visiting my sister in Fort Collins, Colorado. She was there working at the university. And so I did, I went there. And it uh, was a profound, profound experience from which I've never recovered because I basically never left. I basically found myself, I found comfort, I found my niche, I found the movement, I found what I would become a part of in terms of the Chicano movement and um, found ways to express myself uh, by being a part of that. I uh, met my wife of almost 45 years on my second day there in Fort Collins and um, literally fell in love right away. Those things may, maybe don't happen that often, but they clearly happened with us and we've been together ever since. Pamela Maya, who was the head of the Chicano Studies, it wasn't a department, but section of the history department. That was critical because it was through Abel that I started meeting other uh, Chicano students there and became a part of UMAS, the United Mexican American Students. We were 250 Chicanos maybe, out of a population of 11,500. And we represented a much greater number within the population of the state of Colorado at the time. But again, we weren't given the opportunities for getting in. And so entrance to college became an obvious thing for us to work on. The war in particular was incredibly important to me because of the experience I'd had in California. And indeed, I went on to become a fairly central leader in uh, the anti-war movement at, uh, at Colorado State University in 71 and 72. It was in um, spring of 72 that as part of a national uh, uh, day of manifestation and protest that um, a dozen of us or so took over the ROTC building uh, for the Reserve Officer Training Corps. That's what ROTC stood for. 
And these were um, mini factories for officers in the university to train them to go off to the war to, in our opinion, uh, kill more uh, innocent uh, uh, Vietnamese in a war that we thought had no justification whatsoever. Uh, so we took that building over uh, that uh, spring. But when we did, we were part of a movement that took over ROTC buildings throughout the country in, uh, in scores of universities. We were not alone. And I would say that it was that day and that push by 72 that really won the war because by that time um, it was very clear to Nixon and the rest of the country that the war could not go on. That was instrumental in my life because that was a sentinel event in proving to myself that we could do it, that if we made the effort and if we tried that we could make a difference, we could turn people out, we could turn the clock in a different direction and social change would become more than words but could become a reality. Very clearly in the early 70s, late 60s, if you were a young Chicano radical at the university, there was only one thing that was important to us and that was getting back to your community to be a community organizer and really change the conditions under which we were living and the things that were going on around us. I was offered a job as a community organizer in La Junta in southeastern Colorado at the end of 72 and I jumped at the opportunity. And so one of the first things I did was help to start a co-op, a food co-op. So and that was important because it gave some credibility uh, to me and to others that were working on the project in regards to the community and what it was we were trying to do. The next big project that came up that needed to be addressed was that of uh, health services and health care. Now one needs to understand that this is a really different time in our country's history. This was before a federal law called EMTALA, the Emergency Medical uh, <clears throat> Treatment and Labor Act, which was passed in the mid 80s. So this is a dozen years before. So in our country, you could still legally be turned away and refuse health services at a hospital if you didn't have money. If you went to the hospital and uh, wanted to get services, you could be refused services if you did not have money, yes. Now that's incredible for most people to appreciate today. It's very hard to understand what that means, but uh, that's what existed in those days, and that's what we faced in those days. When one thinks about the Community Health Center movement in the state of Colorado, you've got to go back a long ways. Keep in mind that Denver Health was the number two health center in the country. It started in 65. The Salute Family Health Centers, where I've spent many years, um, was started in 1970. Um, Clinica Campesina and Valley Wide were started in 72. And in 1973, I uh, was living in Rocky Ford, and it was there that as a community organizer, we, I realized that what we needed was to come up with a different system of health care for the Chicano uh, the community because we were being excluded from the system of care that existed at that time. We had to deal with the politics. It was like uh, David and Goliath almost, if not worse at times. No one, I don't think in the community, even uh, people who were lifelong members thought we would get anywhere with providing health care for those that had historically been underserved. The frustrating part was trying to make that dream, make that vision come true. There was a lot of stumbling blocks, a lot of um, trial and error. Um, you have to imagine, 
I was 20, 21. Virgil Licona was, I don't know, uh, 24, 23. And he was an outsider, according to a lot of people. And he wasn't only an outsider, he was a rebel rouser. He was a radical. And no, you don't want to bring those kind of kinds of people here and, and their ideas and their vision. What kind of vision? So you, you had to have a commitment to what you were doing in spite of everyone. Um, and that's how the clinic uh, community health center started. And later it even became even more um, political when the name was changed from community health center to La Clinica del Valle. Well, at, at the beginning, it was it was a real uh, downer. Negative ideas about it. Uh, they didn't think it was gonna uh, it was gonna amount to anything. They didn't amount. They didn't think it was gonna amount to anything. Uh, me as a board member, I I, I, uh, I now I look back at it and I'm just thrilled that I was uh, a part of something big that happened. It was just a little little thought of somebody's thought, and here it is. It, it's over the Tri County and they're uh, writing good articles about them, uh, it's just amazing. I just, uh, and, uh, and it's the people that started it. There were a lot of people involved in getting this started, not one, two, or three, but a lot of folks from the community that would later form part of the uh, community board uh, and individuals that were interested in doing the right thing. I was one of those folks. Um, and I was the one that did not take a step back. Uh, the um, community asked me to be the first director of the clinic. Now this is before we had a clinic, okay, but to take that idea and to run with it. And a grant was put together. A young lady named Jennifer was critically important in starting the clinic in Rocky Ford because she was the grant writer. She put together the grant application that went to the Catholic Church and uh, their program called the Campaign for Human Development. And we received a grant of $50,000 for them in the spring of uh, 1973. And it was with that promise of dollars that we started the clinic in Rocky Ford, just like the Salud Family Health Centers was started on a nickel and a dime and selling tamales and cookies and whatever it was we could do to earn money. That's what we did in Rocky Ford. That's what was done in Alamosa. That's what was done throughout the state to get the community health center movement going. How did we do it? Well, we had a big stroke of luck that got it going. I was able to get a doctor from National Jewish to come down for six weeks to work for us for almost nothing. I think it was nothing. And uh, so David Hudgel came down and worked that summer for us. That allowed us to get started. The Catholic Church uh, leased us a three bedroom, two story house in Rocky Ford for a dollar a year. That became our clinic for the next 30 years. I thought it was the ideal situation. And for a young Chicano organizer, it was. You go back to the community, the community loves you. It's lots of work, it's not very much pay, but did I tell you the community loves you and you get stroked all the time? So those are the things that we we're offering, but young doctors were not all that interested in those things then. Um, there were some still burning on fumes from the 60s, so wanting to change things. And Tom Flower, the first doc that I recruited long term there, was one of those, I think. So he came, and uh, once he got there, I knew that I had to go back to school and I had to become a clinician. Now, that's easy to say. Uh, keep in mind, I thought I was going to be teaching Chicano history at this point in my life, so I did not study science. I didn't like science. Um, I could do math, I was good at math, but it wasn't stuff that I had studied. I was a soft social scientist, you know, enveloped in history and the middle evil period and, you know, southwestern history of this country, Mexican history, those things. But I did so not because I wanted to be a doctor, not because I had this great idea of 
healing people and saving lives. I did it because the movement needed another clinician. And although it may be difficult for someone to understand me today when I say that, I sit before you in all honesty and say, that is what motivated me. That is what turned me on. That is what got me to do everything that I've done since. The very fact that I, as a product of the Chicano movement, needed to go back to school to learn a new skill set because the movement needed me to do so seemed by that time in my life only logical. The Partido Raza Unida, for which I had run for student body president five years earlier in Fort Collins, now the founder, Jose Angel Gutierrez, and his wife, Luz Gutierrez, in, in Texas, Along with Avela Maya, my mentor, my tremendous mentor from Fort Collins, uh, put together a treaty, literally a treaty, with the Mexican government. And the Becas para Slan was a scholarship program started by the Raza Unida Party, and the purpose of the program was to be able to send uh, Chicanos, Mexican-Americans that were born and raised in the United States to be able to learn more about Mexico and to be able to go study uh, postgraduate uh, and to obtain postgraduate degrees because those opportunities were not open to them here in the United States. This is now um, 78, the first year of the program and so I went to Mexico City in the summer of 78 as part of that program um, with the idea of studying medicine in Mexico and coming back to serve the Chicano community when I was done. What the program required and asked of us was that um, people that were selected be Chicanos that had all um, played a role in the Chicano movement in their respective states because this was a national program and we pick students from you know around the country not just Colorado obviously I think maybe there were three or four from Colorado now that must but um, this was an important program for the movement and its success was very important and so there was no doubt I needed to be a part of that So it was in 1991, we were in Pueblo, and the opportunity to come to Salud um, lent itself. And I thought about it, and I really thought it was a really good idea, just because being a product of the movement and being engaged in social change, what has always been important to me has been the idea of increasing my sphere of influence not for me individually, but for the message. I consider myself nothing but a messenger for a movement in terms of social justice and equality and health care for all. And that's been my expression as a product of the movement in terms of what I've done. So the larger that sphere of influence, the more lives, the more people, the, the, the larger the impact one will have. And I realized that coming to Salud was a much larger system than what we had in Pueblo. The director at that time, um, Jerry Brasher, had gone to Pueblo in, I don't know, October, November, and made me a deal that I couldn't refuse to come and be the medical director of his exciting Salud health center system here. Um, and it was a different day and age, and the challenge was there, the opportunity to increase that sphere of influence, and um, there were a lot more patients that we were talking about. So it was a, a challenge that I was happy to, to take on and be a part of. Well, I was, I was kind of looking for somebody, and I happened to be talking one day with Dr. Mark Babbitts from the regional office the uh, physician at, at the regional office and uh, in Denver. And so he said that uh, you better look at uh, Dr. Lacona. Anyway, I, I got to thinking about it and I said, you know, I want to see if I can talk you into it. I had done my residency in Fargo, so I was very uh, 
very used to managed care and what that meant because Minnesota was the cradle of the managed care movement in this country. And I had seen hospitals buy up every private practice within a hundred mile radius of Fargo when I was a resident. That, you know, was retarded in, in, in Colorado by 10 or 15 years. So what I had seen earlier was just starting to come to Colorado uh, in the first phase. And that phase didn't take very well. But one of the things that health centers realized was that we had Medicaid patients. In those days, over half our patients were uninsured, and our insured patient was a Medicaid patient. And about 20, 25% of our patients had Medicaid. And we realized that managed care would come to Colorado, that they would somehow um, develop, and if we weren't careful, they would be in control of our Medicaid patients, and we would be what we in those days called bottom feeders. We did not want that to happen and in 93 in Pueblo at a meeting of the community health centers statewide, we made a decision that we wanted to form our own HMO and our own group. So the University Hospital provided the funds and some of the staffing and so on to develop Colorado Access and they had a, a board of directors, I think it was uh, it was nine member board or something and I was one of those members. Now, those were big, bold decisions to make and words easy to say, but it was gonna be quite a task. And it took us two years, but uh, in December of 1995, we had partnered with Denver Health, with uh, the University Hospital, with the Children's Hospital, and with 13 uh, migrant and community health centers. And we formed our own Medicaid HMO called Colorado Access. We had hired someone to be the medical director in November of 95, and we went live. We um, started uh, taking patients in December. Um, he called um, two weeks into the job from an airport in Chicago and resigned. It was a lot more work than he had envisioned. We weren't sure what was gonna happen because we had gone live and we didn't have a medical director. Um, I made the move at that time to become the medical director of Colorado Access, understanding that I would have to take a leave of absence from Salud in order to do that, but also understanding that we needed strong leadership in that position, and we had no time to be looking for someone else and try and get them trained to do the job. All of this, why? Because I'm a product of the movement. I'm a product of the Chicano movement of the late 60s and early 70s, and I've been able to focus my efforts within the healthcare arena to push forth those ideals that we had uh, of the Chicano movement of improving the living status of our population, our communities, uh, and fighting for justice, fighting for equality, fighting for those things that we think each one of us deserves just because we're human beings and we breathe air, we're on this planet, and we're in this together. I'm proud to say that um, uh, I can hold my head high because that's what's driven me, that's what's motivated me, and that is what has um, guided my thinking throughout my adult professional life. It's not something that I held on to as a young radical hothead and let go of when I got uncomfortable with it or got a certain level of education. I've never parted with my ideals and I've never parted with the need for me to look at myself as a public servant. Someone here to care for my community because I said early on in my life that that's what I was going to do. If we can teach the ideals of justice, of equality, of being egalitarian, that's why we started the movement. That's what it was all about. And we must continue that, whether it is I, or now in this particular case, I handing off the torch to that next generation or generations uh, and realizing that if each of us makes his or her contribution, 
we will be successful. We'll be successful as a people, we'll be successful as an individual, we'll be successful as a movement. I remember when I was at Valdez Elementary and I was running a school-based clinic for Denver Health there, and within three months of being there, a, a principal came into the clinic and she says, you know what? She said, I just left a third grade classroom and um, all the girls, most of the girls in the classroom said they wanted to be a pediatrician. She said, before you came along, uh, most of them would talk about being a secretary or uh, a teacher. Hopefully, you know, Dr. Lincoln and my story and other people's stories will, will be able to help recruit young people into a health profession because it's been a really, really great experience. I am almost done with my pre-medicine program. Um, I have one more year left. What's next is to apply and get into medical school, which is another four years. And depending on what I specialize, it'll be a few years after that. Um, so if anyone were to come up to me and say, what do I expect? Wanda, I want to go into the medical field. I want to go into the health care. You know, what do I need to know? Tell me. And I mean, I'm going to tell them what no one told me, you know, it's which is you're going to have to work hard, harder than you have ever worked before. You're going to struggle so much and you're going to go through a bunch of challenges that you think that it's going to be the end of it. And no, I mean, it's not. There's going to be times where you're going to be discriminated against for not completely knowing the English all the way, I guess you could say, or just because of the language barriers, you know, or because you're um, a Latina, or Latino, Mexican-American, or whatever, and they're going to look at you like they did me. Like, I've had more than I could count experiences where, oh, you're going to be a, oh, you're wanting to be a doctor? Why? Like, are you sure that's where you want to go? Or, you know, there's not a lot of women that's there, right? You know, there's not a lot of, Hispanics or Latinos or Mexicans that go into that field where they doubt me. They doubt what I can do. And those are gonna, those are kind of big punches in the face, I guess, or into your pride and determination. But you just gotta get, take them as they come. And it's gonna be difficult, but you have to stay persistent, determined, you know, and be committed to what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm.